Hi, folks. Hello, you have dried out since this morning. I'm Lauren Anke. I am director of NPR Music in Washington, D.C., and here are my esteemed panelists. I looked out uh, the door at the Empire this morning at 7 a.m. Hi, John. Um, uh, to go out and get some coffee, and as I was walking out, I was on the phone, and I saw this river go by, and I thought, am I dreaming? You know, it's one of those things. I was in New York at the Empire, and there was a river in the street. Uh, so, uh, this year marks the centennial of Dave Brubeck's birth. Uh, he was born in December 1920, and there's a tremendous amount to celebrate and commemorate about his remarkable, remarkable career and his deep legacy. Um, but we want to focus a little bit this conversation about Dave Brubeck as a jazz ambassador and jazz itself as a kind of ambassador. In 1958, uh, the Dave Brubeck uh, Quartet went on tour organized by the U.S. Department of State. Uh, the 120-day tour included Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, uh, what is now Sri Lanka, Ceylon then, India, Turkey, and a two-week stint in Poland, uh, which was really transformative for the audience there. Uh, today we want to reflect on the importance of the tour and the whole enterprise of jazz as an ambassador, both in his career and jazz more widely, and we have a fabulous panel uh, here to do that uh, for us. Um, in the middle there, uh, pianist and composer Darius Brubeck has been playing and teaching jazz for decades. Uh, in 1983, he initiated the first university jazz study degree at an African university. Uh, he taught at the University of KwaZulu Natal, Durban, Durban, South Africa, until 2005. Uh, he's currently based in England, touring internationally with the Darius Brubeck Quartet. And Brubeck's play Brubeck, which I hope some of you saw last night at Dizzy's. It was great. Uh, he joined his father for those Polish concerts in 1958, so he had a front row seat uh, to this remarkable story. Trumpet player John Faddis has played with virtually everybody, everybody, as he was coming up even, um, before he made an incredible mark of his own, and his distinctive trumpet appears on hundreds of records and numerous soundtracks for film and TV. You can hear, of course, his dynamic original compositions, on the jazz opera Lulu Noir and albums like Remembrances, Hornucopia, Into the Fatosphere, and Taranga, just to name few, a few. Uh, in addition to forming his own quintet, he's directed several orchestras, including the Grammy-winning United Nation Orchestra, the Dizzy Gillespie 70th Birthday Big Band, and of course, Dizzy Gillespie plays a big role in this story. The Dizzy Gillespie Alumni All-Stars, the Chicago Jazz Ensemble, the Carnegie Hall Centennial Big Band, Carnegie Hall Jazz Band, and the John Faddis Jazz Orchestra of New York. And he has been an educator also for decades and has worked with students from all over the world. Uh, and last but not least, uh, my fellow Lauren and a, a longtime uh, a Cleveland native, so our hearts are joined there, has appeared in a host of uh, national and international venues. She's a frequent collaborator with artists like Bilal, Robert Glasper, Christian McBride. Uh, her first terrific album entitled Gorgeous Chaos from 2016 uh, came out to great acclaim. And in 2018, she won the Cerevon International Jazz Vocal Competition Award. And I think John was one of the judges, maybe, in that mix. Uh, and she has toured in the American Music Abroad program and is just back from Russia, like just, just, like New Year's Eve. So thank you all uh, for sharing your time with us today. Um, although we're going to have a we're going to have a focus look at, at Dave Brubeck's career around this idea of jazz ambassadors, I wonder if we could just kick off with a couple of thoughts about his overall legacy. From where you sit, as we celebrate a centennial, what would be one or two things to keep top of mind about why Dave Brubeck still should should matter to us? John, do you think you could kick that off? No. <laughs> no, kidding. I knew you were going to be For trouble. myself, um, Dave, you know, Dave Brubeck's music has meant a lot to me since I first started playing the trumpet. Of course, I started playing the trumpet after hearing Louis Armstrong. But my first public jazz trumpet solo was on Take Five. And, and I think his mixing of the time signatures 
is one of the most important contributions. And I remember another panel, and it was uh, where where Dave was speaking, and he said he was on this panel, and he was questioning whether his whether or not his music was good enough, because it, you know because that's what we do. We do stuff like that. And on the other panel was, a, a, I think, a griot and a chieftain from Africa who told him, no, you stick with what you're doing. What you're doing is right. And when, when I heard that, I said, yeah, well, I remember Dizzy telling me stuff like that. So I think the, the, the different time signatures and compositions, you know, he had a great group. It was integrated. Uh, I think that's what I think of when I think of Dave Brubeck. Um, person, on a personal note, uh, I'm 15 years older than my wife. And when we first met, her parents, were, they were very leery of an older jazz musician marrying their daughter. But then I introduced my mother-in-law to Dave Brubeck at the, at the, <laughs> at the, at the Watergate Hotel in, in, in Washington, D.C., and then I was okay. <laughs> so he's had a big influence on my life. That's good cred right there. Lauren, uh, what about for you? How is, w when you think of Dave Brubeck and his impact, what's been notable for you? I think legacy, especially in the era where it's just a moment in time that something's hot on social media, in the music industry, on the charts. Things are created with that in mind, with that specific formula in a lot of genres. But his music and his legacy spans genre. And it's on the soundtrack to my life, even though I was not even alive when he created Take Five and some of the other tunes, um, because that's his legacy. And I think that that's immensely important as a creator to just think about is this music, one, mine? Is this, is this my idea? Is this my heart being poured into it? Am I being swayed by all the different influences in the world and letting that dictate what I put out? Or am I going to look back in 50 years or look from the heavens or wherever I am and be like, wow, this music is still relevant in 2020. Um, so that's what I think of. That's what comes first in mind, legacy. Darius, I know the question for you is complicated because he was your dad. Um, yeah. but, but maybe you could also talk about what we might have to look forward to this year uh, in the centennial. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm very moved by uh, what Lauren just said. Obviously, I agree. But the way you said it was uh, thoughtful and moving. And uh, John, thanks for sharing those stories uh, with me. Um, yeah, 2020 was uh, launched in January, not quite at the beginning of the year, but we were at the uh, GEN, Jazz Education Network uh, conference in New Orleans, and we launched Brubeck Living Legacy. And that's completely a family-controlled entity now. And I can only, there, there are some pamphlets around, I can only, you know, rather than give a laundry list of events, that uh, I, I can't keep it all in my head. But if you kind of check in online, we're beginning to use the 21st century, even in the Brubeck family. Uh, <laughs> you'll begin to get a sense of the, the, the span of that legacy from being a very in-depth archive, which gives a lot of in, insight, not only into my father's career, but uh, my mother's contribution to it, and really what the music business was like in the middle of the last century. It's very, you know, for those of you who are academically inclined or just curious, it's very interesting in a way to know uh, what jazz musicians were up against, um, among other things, uh, racial segregation in the South uh, um, as a real, Difficulty, and there's quite a lot of correspondence that sort of covers that. Um, but coming up through the year, there will be uh, classical uh, concerts or concerts that show uh, other another side of Dave Brubeck, other than uh, the kind of 
show my brothers and I did last night at Dizzy's where, you know, we touched some, uh, you know, popular highlights and tried to reveal some other repertoire too. So it wasn't all just touring and being a jazz quartet. I think this year, uh, because of the books coming out, um, there, there's two that are already published, Dave Brubeck, A Life in Time by Philip Clark, and Dave Brubeck's Time Out by Stephen Crist. There's a book on the real ambassadors, and there's a book uh, by, by Keith Hatchek. There's a book in the pipeline on Dave's sacred work. So that's four publications that I know of that are in-depth studies of his music. And obviously, that's coordinated uh, around the centennial. I'll be uh, bouncing back and forth between England, where I actually live now, and the US for some of these events. Um, but as far as specifics, you know, please, uh, you know, I guess most of you are from New York, but some may not be, you know, just check because, you know, we're, Brubeck Centennial events are going to be all over the place, not only in the US, I'm going to the Hong Kong Arts Festival in February, provided that's still possible. And, uh, you know, we'll be in Switzerland, Poland, all, all over, and certainly all over the States. Um, I guess that's enough. Yeah, it's going to be a great year. Um, we'll, look. we'll give it a shout out by the end of the session, right? Yeah, Do you have yeah. It? well, look, look up Brubeck Living Legacy, and that will, that will connect through to events that are already scheduled. Darius, now you were on the tour of Poland, right? Yeah. You weren't on the whole 120 days, right? But no, I, was, I, 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 I did all of Poland. The okay. State Department... Um, yeah, could you give us your remembrances of that visit? Well, you know, it's kind of a layered thing because uh, as not only an adult, but I hasten to mention an elderly adult looking back, I can, you know, I can think of it in terms of all the political transformations that have taken place in the meantime. But I'll try to be honest, uh, as a kid, what struck me the most was how damn cold Poland was in <laughs> February and March. And that means inside, people wore their coats into the hotel and never took them off in restaurants, and you threw your overcoat on the bed. Why? Because 1958 in uh, Eastern Europe is still post-war. The infrastructure was pretty much destroyed. Those economies had been pretty much destroyed. 80% of Warsaw was still just piles of bricks with clear spaces bulldozed out between them. So it was my first exposure to cold, <laughs> to serious poverty, to what it would be, you know, what life was like for many people in the world. I was, uh, I was a 10-year-old kid from uh, Northern California. You know, to me, cold was a day you had to put a sweater on before you went to school. And on the positive side, the utter devotion that people had to the music, uh, to my parents, their friendliness, their uh, almost religious zeal, you know, and spending like a month's salary to go to a couple of concerts or follow the group around on tour. And it wasn't just a momentary phenomenon because uh, in the Brubeck collection, there, there are quite a few postcards and letters, you know, written in imperfect but sincere English where they kept up correspondence. But I think that says something about my parents, too, that they, they would write back mm -hmm. and they would encourage uh, those musicians to keep doing what they were doing in Poland or come to the States or give them recommendations, things like that. Um, and when I was last in Poland, Am I taking too much time? Uh, <clears throat> when I was last in Poland was in 2018. So if you're quick with doing sums, it was the 60th anniversary of that 1958 tour. And um, guess what? It was emotional. Not just for me, although it, it, it deeply was, but also some people came with 
you know, their grandchildren kind of helping them in. Uh, those were people who had lived from Nazism to communism to liberation, and they were kind of tracing the beginning of all that, not the cause, but the beginning, the era, the timing of all of that movement to listening to the voice of America, which launched in 1956, then Dave Brubeck's tour in 1958, where a lot of these people met each other, learned to trust each other a bit, kept in touch. And then here they were again coming to see me. Uh, one of them even spoke to my wife, who was on the tour, and said, you know, I don't remember much about the Dave Brubeck Quartet, but there were, there, uh, my brother Mike was with me. There were these two little boys. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was one of the, the little boys who uh, played on that tour just, just briefly. It was just a kind of uh, public relations stunt. And you really felt and this is far beyond what the State Department thought they were achieving. This is an interesting thing. Okay, the State Department did want to bring someone who was popular from the West, someone who they knew had a following behind the Iron Curtain, and wanted to make an impression that America was, oh, you know, not just a mighty military power, uh, but, you know, had culture that was important. Okay, so. Dave Brubeck Quartet, late 50s, good choice, almost an obvious choice. But even the State Department and its wildest dreams couldn't have imagined the extent to which the Polish people extrapolated from that a whole vision of, you know, the West as, as, as we would prefer to think about it, not as it always was then or, or even now but you know, as a place where you have freedom and individuality and skills and, and all of that. And, and the way I know it is at the beginning of the Solidarity Museum in Shechen, um, I was like on sort of a VIP tour with my wife and the group and say, okay, well, you know, I like to learn my history from going to places. And I was really surprised to see in the very first vitrine of the Solidarity Museum was uh, early 50s shortwave radio, which would have been illegal to own, and a Dave Brubeck program in, Poland, in, in Polish. So, you know, that, that says something. How, you know, again, I don't want to assign cause where there probably wasn't that much of a direct cause, but a strong association of Western values, rule of law, democracy, with jazz and with that tour. Yeah, I mean, the, the USIA it was trying to, of course, do a number of things there, but one of them was to counter what they, you know, was propaganda countering other propaganda yeah. um, a, about a vision of the United States, but also sort of grappling with um, a critique of the US about what was happening here uh, in our violent resistance to the 1950s civil rights movement, right? So we get, of course, the story of Louis Armstrong refusing to go out on the tour after what uh, happened in, in Little Rock. So um, the, the, the political and, and um, kind of race complexities around these visits is, is deep. And it's, I think there's an interesting, it's what the musicians were experiencing with, with people and listeners and, and what the government wanted, and that's in, a, in quite a stew. John, as a, as a musician, were you aware that these tours were happening in the 50s? Dizzy Gillespie goes first, uh, and then Dave. Well, I knew about Dizzy's trip in 1956. And, and I think one of the things that I learned later, because I went with Thad Jones and Mel Lewis's orchestra, including Dee Dee Bridgewater in 1972. And we weren't allowed to fraternize with any of the Russian musicians. We, we did five weeks in Russia, and we weren't allowed to play with them. And I, my theory is it's because jazz represented freedom. And they did not want it. So we had to go underground mm. and sort of ditch the KGB uh, 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 you know, our 
yeah. translators and all that stuff. And we had to hide from them and go meet these and then have a jam session. Wow. Um, I later did a, a State Department tour with my own group, with Rini Rostness and Louis Nash, and that was about 1987. But the, what I, what I so remember- to Russia there on that one? That was to um, Dresden and Berlin, just before the wall came down. Uh, Portugal, Iceland. But what I remember about Dizzy's tour and reading about his, and I read about that when I was a young kid, is that the government, when he got to, you know, he went to different countries. He didn't go to Poland, but he went to Syria. He went to Greece, Turkey. He went down to South America. And when he got to um, Turkey, there were, there, there were only wealthy people sitting in the audience. And Dizzy said, I came to play for all the people. Let them in. Because it was just crowded and, and, and uh, all these people wanted to get in and that was it. He became a hero after that. And, and the, I guess the narrative was from the other side, how can you represent the government of America when you get treated like a second class citizen? And with Dizzy, I know he, he would say, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. It's not easy to talk about yeah. because I know from, from personal experience as well as stories that I've heard from other musicians like James Moody when he was in the service. He was down in, was it Georgia? Stationed down in Georgia. And the black soldiers weren't allowed to eat in the, in the mess with the white soldiers but they were bringing German prisoners of war in to do that. So that was, a, that was a big question when I went there. You know, how can you represent a government that treats you like a second class citizen? Did you get that question from some of the musicians that you met there? No, not at all. Because they, they knew the music from uh, Willis Conover, Voice of America. And that was fortunate. By, by the time I went, you know, that's 15 years, you know, 15 years since Dizzy and 14 years since Dave went over. So the, the I guess the experience of being there, it makes you think. And music is something that, you know, brings people together. I, you know, Ricky Riccardi, Louis Armstrong in Africa, and the Civil War, and you got one warring faction on one side and the other on the other side, and they're carrying him into the city. That's what music is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring people together. And somebody found somebody in the government. I can't imagine that happening now with the administration. Oh, you're so right. Yeah. I, you know, because he, he don't even show up to the, the, the Kennedy, Kennedy honors. Our president, your president, well, yeah. somebody's president. Yeah. Somebody's. <laughs> Lauren, can you talk a little bit about the program that you've recently toured with? Um, yeah, I would love to. Um, I actually went to Krakow, I went to Lublin, I went to Warsaw, and I'm also someone who really likes to take in the history and the culture of a place when I go, no matter where I go, even if it's not with American Music Abroad, which is the program that I was able to travel with. Um, and I was able to go to the Holocaust Museum and just really take in a lot of it. And jazz played a very integral role in bringing people together and giving them a little bit of something to look forward to when, as you said, the whole city was just demolished, and Warsaw specifically, and just to see it bright and shining with this old architecture that's completely new comparatively, um, was, was really astonishing and learning that history. Um, but more, more than that, just really looking at being briefed on the program as it was when Brubeck and Dizzy um, went and saying you're on, you know, you're representing just like they were, kind of, that's what you kind of hear in the briefing for that program. Um, and internalizing that and moving the way you move 
as, a, as an individual, as an artist. Mm -hmm. For me, as a woman, as a black woman from Cleveland, Ohio, from the east side of Cleveland, Ohio, St. Clair Avenue to be exact, not a crystal stair. Um, and having parents who are from the south. My father's from Nashville. He's told me so many stories about the hardships that he's encountered and tons of things. He was part of the Great Migration, which is why I grew up in Cleveland. Um, thinking about all those things and all the shoulders I'm standing on as I'm representing the United States abroad in some of the very places that so many amazing creators and artists were in before me was a very daunting and um, somewhat in intimidating um, task because I didn't know what to expect. And what I found was extremely um, grateful um, audiences, ones who had an idea of what jazz was, but didn't really know or understand the fact that just like Americans, jazz is so diverse. And now we have all these branches from Dave Brubeck, all these people who listen to Dave Computed, all that stuff, and then is outputting this music that is a little bit of that, a little bit of that tradition, but their voice, intrinsically their voice. Branches from John Faddis, like, you know what I mean? Like, it just goes on and on. And the fact that me, as a woman walking around now in 2019 when I was there, just existing, just breathing, just singing, just talking, just walking in the room is awareness that this diversity exists. These different types of people in my group, there was John Michelle, who was, um, whose family hails from Haiti. Um, and I had another band member who's Dominican and Haitian, and then I have another band member who's from Philly, and, we, and I'm from Cleveland, so there's all these different um, diverse contributions to the music and backgrounds to the music, and we are there representing that individually, but also the United States um, as a whole, as residents and natives, even if it's first generation of the United States. So they're taking me in, and you can see, physically see, almost tangibly feel them actually taking you in and saying, what is this sound? Wow, this is different. Oh, I can hear a little bit of that. And we also had the chance to not only perform for these audiences throughout Poland, Montenegro, and Ukraine, but also do workshops and um, integrate ourselves with the artists from all those places and students from all those places and sing with them and teach them the things that we know and them ask us questions about our influences and what we think jazz is and how we are in America and, and all sorts of pop culture things, but also just musical things. And it, it just was a really rewarding experience. And you might think when you're first offered or invited to tour on behalf of the United States that it might be 70-30 that you are giving something to this audience and maybe you'll get a little bit back. But I think I might have walked away with more than those audiences did, even though they followed us from, from state to state and city to city and walked on stage and gave us flowers during our show. They seemed really grateful and really into it. Um, and, and very, um, they, they're messaging me now in my inbox on, on, on Instagram and on Facebook. So they, they were very involved and, and really taken by what we did, but so were we. We, we really, We've never been to these places. And honestly, they specifically sent us to cities where the demographic was 97% white. They had never seen anybody who looked at me. Some of these places were looked like me. Some of these places were small off the map cities. Warsaw, not. But you know, some of the other ones, like Lublin and um, Uzhgorod, Ukraine, and all these different places, I literally was stopped for photos just because I looked the way that I did wherever I went. Um, so that was a it, that was an experience as well. <laughs> it was it was quite a bit. I can talk a lot about it, but I won't bore you guys. <laughs> I have kind of a funny story. When we went to Russia, it was 1972, and there were several of us in Thad and Mel's band that had 
big afros. <laughs> and we were in, in uh, Belize. Mm. And we walked into a restaurant one night, gave our coats to the hat check lady, and then we started to walk into the restaurant. Everybody's gone. Maybe Cecil Bridgewater, myself, uh, Steve Furtado, big guy. We start walking away, and the, and the oh. coat check lady says, Nyet, Nyet, Nyet. Mm. And she saw our afros. She thought they were hats. Wow. <laughs> no, and so we, we went back to her, what's wrong with you? And she's pointing, and we say, no, no, no. She had, she had never seen hair like that. Yeah. <laughs> she thought it was a hat. You know those black hats they wear? Yeah, yeah. Now it would be a gray hat. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It would look pretty good, though. Yeah, it would. But it was, it was, yeah. it was, it was funny that they hadn't seen that because they had African students there uh, in Russia, but they, they had the short, shorter afros. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the afro afros. 72 yeah. afros. Yeah. 72, yo. <laughs> Earth, um, wind, and fire. Yeah, John, you were saying, you know, jazz, you're thinking about those 50s tours, jazz equaled freedom. That was sort mm. of the message that it carried with it. 70 years or so on, what kind of message? I mean, Lauren, maybe, did, did, did jazz itself sort of have, a, a, I mean, it's such an established thing, right? Here we are. Mm -hmm. um, did you find that it carried some sense of freedom to, to audiences in your recent experience? What I think is that, because our, our program was a mix, well, first let me tell you, our program was gonna be strictly jazz standards because we thought, I, I'm a, a writer, a composer, and I, I thought a lot of my songs are narrative. They're about my life, what I've gone through right now, and they may be wordy for somebody who's not really you know, acquainted with the English language intimately. So I said, we're gonna do all standards. They know these, these are ones that, you know, they've been listening to for decades. Get there and all the advertisements are for my music videos for my original tunes. So that, that was the first inkling that this isn't gonna go exactly as you thought, the way you saw it in your head. So um, we did a lot of jazz standards and we hearkened back to all the vocalists and instrumentalists um, that one would in the tradition. But speaking to the freedom piece, jazz is freedom even now. And what they didn't know was that while these are new lyrics, the formula is the same. The bones are traditional, but my message and my delivery and my improvisation is modern and is different than the next person you might hear. And theirs is gonna be a little bit different from mine. Even the most similar singer to me, maybe, there's gonna be that little bit of creative freedom. And that's where the freedom piece came in. There is a freedom of expression. While you may be used to hearing this type of thing, I'm gonna come in and sing something else. Or while you're used to hearing a certain um, arpeggiated phrase on this tune, this Haitian bassist is not gonna play it the same way that someone would from Poland because they're gonna be swinging hard maybe he's gonna play it with a different type of vibe. And I think that in itself, us actually demonstrating that for them, and in a lot of instances, we played it down the way it would, been, would have been played in, in the 50s or the 60s, but then we would also change it just to show them and demonstrate how you can communicate your own language um, through this music called jazz. And I think, in essence, they got the, the freedom aspect of it because jazz is that free language. We, it's, it's one of the only art forms, if not the only one, where there is no ceiling <laughs> for us to actually communicate with each other. So I, I think that's where the freedom part came in for me. Um, and just, I, I just, I just remember looking at their faces, specifically the instrumentalists and the, the vocalists, and seeing them say, their eyes say, oh, I, I can do that. I can do this, I can say that. And in one instance, is, I'll leave it to these guys, um, there was a young girl, she must have been 16, and she was trying to sing 
So nice. Mm. Someone to hold me tight, that would be very nice. She's like singing it, but the words are all wrong because she, the English is not her first language and she's, she's stumbling pretty badly. And I stopped her and I said, so there's often times when us as vocalists, we got all these songs in our head. There may come a time where we forget the lyrics. Ella did it all the time. She made them up on the spot and you actually ended up enjoying the song. And she's like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And I said, so why don't you improvise right now? And why don't you sing to this song so nice? Sing it in Polish. Sing something that happened to you today on your way here or happened to you yesterday. Sing it in your language because even though this is a classic American art form and these bones are traditionally American of this song or Brazilian in that case, you can sing your language. There's no rules against you actually right now yeah. making up what you want to say. And that would seem here like you would know that. But she didn't. And her mind was just blown like, wow, yeah. I'm going to do this in my shows from now yeah. on when I have my recitals at school. So that was awesome to witness. Darius, did, did your father talk a lot about that first 58 experience? Was that something that stuck with him, do you think? Very much so. It was very important to him, um, both as a learning experience, it was important uh, to his career. It was also the basis for writing The Real Ambassadors, which uh, some of you may, may know about. All, for, for those who don't know about it already, it was a musical uh, that Dave and Iola Rubeck wrote together. Uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, was the star, was the lead character, and the uh, idea of the show, which was Lou, with Louis Armstrong, Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross, uh, the rest of the Louis Armstrong uh, all-stars as cast members with uh, Trummy Young doing some nice character roles, a little bit of singing, uh, and the rest of the Dave Brubeck quartet. And what what that was, was really a kind of critique of the, of, of the whole Cold War uh, cultural exchange thing. And, and some, some of the things, some of the lyrics come very close to uh, the, the discussion that we're um, having today. Uh, one, one of Louis's lines uh, in a song called The Real Ambassador is, uh, in a song called The Real Ambassador is, uh, Though I represent the government, the government don't represent some policies I'm for. Um, there's also uh, a very fast kind of Gilbert and Sullivan briefing song delivered by Lam Lambert Hendricks and Ross. Uh, in, um, and uh, Trummy Young is being like the uh, State Department guy who's setting them up for the tour, saying, you know, remember who you are and what you represent. <laughs> Um, and, but there's always, you know, like pushback in, in the lyrics and the portrayal. It's, it's not heavy handed, but it's, but it could be, you know, if you read it closely, it can be quite satirical and even, even sarcastic. And the great thing about those tours, and this certainly proved to be the case, uh, for Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, Charles Mingus, we haven't mentioned him yet, but he, he, he did one. Louis Armstrong did after uh, Dave did. Duke Ellington finally agreed to do it. But what, all of this was building a platform for <laughs> musicians to uh, say, okay, you've given us prestige, you've given us uh, official status, and therefore a platform to... Uh, criticize things in America that aren't right. In that, in that era, it was uh, typically racial segregation. That simply uh, had to be destroyed and overthrown. And at least in an official way and in a large public way, it was, uh, it, it was dur during that era. That was the era of uh, you know, the big civil rights movement and Martin Luther King and all that. So, Dave not only discussed the 1958 tour, he, 
that was like the foundation of a major work. And it was also a major work, as I found out more uh, subsequently through uh, uh, other people talking about it, it was also a major highlight in Louis Armstrong's career. Not by any means the most popular thing he ever did, but one of, one of the most meaningful. Um, the other thing about it, of course, and I'll be just briefly on, on this point, was the encounter of musics from other cultures, you know, because there's no internet, there's no streaming, you communicated by phone, if at all, or aerograms. So for him, it was really revelatory, um, hearing uh, Turkish music, for example, and Indian music. There, there's some footage of him jamming in Madras with some Indian musicians, and that, that's an often told story. But cert certainly that tour was uh, a big moment, a pivotal moment that uh, inspired a lot of creativity. And actually, um, yeah, my parents throughout their life, lives uh, continued to uh, kind of expand on that, on, on those lessons, what they learned, and uh, sometimes the personal connections uh, remained important. So it was a big thing. And, and Chopin, of course, your father visited Chopin's, yeah. uh, visited his grave, is that how no, the story no. goes? No, uh, no. First place? Chopin, <laughs> Chopin's grave, we don't know where it is. His heart is buried in uh, Warsaw. That, 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 that was his dying wish. Um, it was Chopin's house, or at least one of his houses, and remarkably, with all the destruction around there, it hadn't been destroyed, and uh, Dave was so moved by this that he, he wrote a piece called Jinkuye um, on the train uh, from Warsaw to Poznan, which was the last concert on the tour. I can't resist saying it was the last concert on my tour, as well, and I recorded it. So that's my latest output is uh, the Darius Brubeck Quartet, live in Poland. Don't hate me for doing that, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> and Jinkuye means thank you. Yes, and Jinkuye means thank you. Jinkuye, John. John. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> John, when you were touring um, as part of these, you know, these kind of official visits, did you feel tension between kind of what you wanted to say? Did you feel restricted at all by some of the government stuff? What was, was that in play for you at all? I was 18. Yeah. I, I didn't think so much about um, the politics of it. You know, we had the briefings, you're supposed to behave a certain way. We were very limited in what they would allow us to do. Roland Hanna, the pianist in the band, was walking around taking pictures you know, of, you know, of buildings and stuff, and it turned out to be a military installation. And these guys grabbed him, and they were going to throw it. But he, you know, they got the film out of the camera. But I didn't do that. You know, at that time, the one thing, and, and most of the interactions that I had were with, the, with the Russians were in the bar. Mm. And they would always set up a chess set. <laughs> that was during the time of Fisher Spassky. Yeah. Yeah, and that was a big, you know, that they were all, you know, they were, yes, play chess, let's play chess. And it was just fun. Mm -hmm. uh, not really uh, talking politics, but bonding over chess, and then later bonding over the music, you know, with some of the musicians that we jammed with. But we played for some big audiences in arenas, you know, 5,000 people. And... Uh, there was this one particular uh, concert we did, and the next day, Roland Hanna, Richard Davis, the bassist, and I were in a taxi, and we were going to somewhere. And we get in the taxi, and the guy's driving, wait a minute, musician? Yes. <laughs> Jazz? Yes. Ted Jones, Mel Lewis Orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was at the concert. Mm -hmm. I have a concert last night. I have a question. <laughs> I see what do Thad Jones. Thad Jones, conductor, composer, arranger, flugelhornist. But 
what do Mel Lewis? <laughs> Not, not, much, not much talk of politics uh, when we were there, but we knew when we wanted to play with the Russian musicians that we met backstage, there was always security to say no, no interaction with the musicians. So they arranged it so we could go underground and have jam sessions with uh, Russian musicians. They didn't want us to inter intermingle with the musicians at all. Any especially memorable um, moments in some of those early jam sessions when you were first there that surprised you musically? Or? Not so much at that time, but, but probably 16, 17 years later, I met a Russian pianist who was at the jam session, and he said it changed his life. He was at a f festival in Pori, Finland. It changed his life. Lauren, you were going to say something there a second ago. Oh, no, I, w I was going <laughs> to, a while back. I'm, I'm so enjoying these stories and, and hearkening back. I was just going to say about Jinkuya, um, when I saw footage of him actually mm -hmm. playing Jinkuya, um, I remember that the audience was completely silent for at least a minute, which is mm -hmm. a long time when you're on stage. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a final song. Yeah. And then there was like roarous applause and, and you know, people were cheering and literally cheering like they were at a game. So, mm -hmm. which reminds me of just even now today when we performed, the audiences were very reserved, especially in, in Poland. But then <clears throat> after the show, they, they would applaud um, at the end, not so much during solos, it just was a very interesting um, audience, performer, interaction. But then, at the end, when we would try to leave, the entire hallway, the door was blocked, everybody, it was full court press. Like, literally, you could not walk to the dressing room. Everybody wanted to actually talk to us, ask us questions, invite us back to different festivals and things that were happening. Um, so, I was just going to interject and say that um, because that song actually reminded me, watching footage of that song reminded me of our experiences there. Yeah. It's interesting, right? The government had this idea that jazz was going to be a powerful political tool and that they could potentially control what it meant and how people responded to it. Um, now, music is circulating so much more easily that you know, that idea that you could control something is sort of impossible, right? So audiences much, must be getting pieces and parts of the music in ways tiny, that they maybe wouldn't have before. Tiny bits and pieces, but as we were doing some of the workshops, they were saying, who are some of your favorite artists? Who are some of the people that you're listening to right now? And we're talking about new and old artists. You know, we're talking about James, Fran James Francis and Jasmia Horn and all these people. And they're like, oh, who is this? And they're like writing it down when in our community, so insular in the music community, we know these names of all these folks. So it's still, especially in, um, in, in Russia and in China, it's still very controlled the way some of our music is, is, is coming in. And what I remember through my recent times in Russia is that more often than not, the popular music that's playing of Americans' music is pop. It's, it's 1990s kind of like, mm -hmm. It's Mariah Carey, it's um, George Michael. Like, that's what's playing on the radio a lot of times. I think it takes a little bit of time for the music that's happening right now to actually make the airwaves in some of these places. Um, however, as the audiences are, are being younger and younger, they're accessing the VPNs to get to the Spotify's and Instagram and other sort of thing. But what I was surprised about was that a lot of places you still did need a VPN to actually get onto some of these American platforms, like the Twitters and the Facebooks and the and, and the Instagram. So, and that's where a lot of music these days is, is shared, um, in addition to Spotify and a different and Apple Music. But that's not available everywhere. So, that was definitely something that was surprising to me. John, you've taught a, a lot of students, and I would imagine a lot of international students. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to uh, say next, is one of the things uh, Dave Brubeck did, he pioneered the, you know, the concerts at colleges. And, and having taught at Purchase College for over 20 years, now teaching at the Manhattan School of Music, 
there are a lot of international students that are so into this music from Korea, from China, mm -hmm. from Japan, from Poland, from Russia, France, England, Norway, from Africa, South Africa, Northern Africa. And so jazz is really, in the schools you're starting to see because, what, what is it, Generation X or something like that? A lot of students expect things to be given to them on a silver platter. On their phone. On their phone. <laughs> and, and, and well, that's another thing. You know, they have their phone, you have thousands of songs on it, and they don't know one song. Mm -hmm. The students that come from the other countries are kicking America's <laughs> butt, because they will, if, you, if the family is sacrificing to send their, their son or daughter to America to study, you can, you can be sure that they're in the practice room 12 hours a day. I see it too often. And, but it's okay because the music is for everyone. As, as Dizzy said, um, you can't steal a gift. Mm -hmm. You can't steal a gift. And it's a great book titled by, written by Gene Lees where yeah, they talk about that. You can't steal a gift. So we get students from all over the world now. And they're learning this American art form. And sometimes they put their own spin on it, whether it's lyrics in Poland or whether it's someone who's a trumpet player from, from uh, Lebanon. Mm. Ibrahim Malouf, he said, what should I do? What, how, do, how do I play jazz? I said, you use your native music and do it in a jazz manner. He's a big star over there now. He got a, he got a four valve trumpet so he can play the in-between note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you do. And Dave Rubeck, you know, he's getting in college, getting this music into college. It wasn't easy because jazz is the ugly stepchild. Hmm. You, know, you know, classical musicians, that was it. We are number one. We are number one. And jazz, you know, that, it's always been like that with, with us. Jazz, the blues, gospel, hmm. field hollers, you know, slave songs, prison songs. It has something special that reaches inside of people. When you hear Billie Holiday, you're not going to be laughing. You know, sometimes when you hear something that Louis Armstrong plays on the trumpet, we're going to demonstrate that tomorrow, you can't help but laugh. Mm -hmm. yeah. It goes through all of the emotions. Your dad in college, mm -hmm. jazz in the school. Yeah. So that's a big thing, but I tell the kids, look, you're here in the classroom, you want to learn this music, you got to get on the bandstand, period. You know, you can learn all the X, Y's and Z's and the chords in a, in a classroom, but what happens when you get on the bandstand and you get nervous or you get anxious and you freeze up? Yeah. That's where you learn the music. I want to carry on from uh, some of that because you hit some really high points uh, as far as just I like, life lessons. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some of the, some of the notes you played at St. John the Divine Cathedral are still echoing mm. up there. I left a lot of space so they did it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the um, I guess the points I want to pick up on um, it really has more to do with jazz in general than, than just my father, but it's certainly something I experience by being so directly connected to him. And that is that, you know, you could go to a club in uh, Krakow, we could say, uh, or Istanbul, and maybe here exactly, you know, not exactly, but you, you might as well be in San Francisco, and yet they might be Turkish or Polish musicians um, so there's that aspect of jazz. It's become so global and universal and so much uh, 
training is available now to everyone everywhere, and that's great. On the other hand, you could go to that club and hear something you would only hear if you were in Istanbul or Krakow. And I think jazz is valuable because of both those kinds of experiences being available. But certainly it's true in, in South Africa. You get guys playing the, well, a lot of guys playing sort of out of the uh, jazz messengers tradition, not necessarily those songs, but that kind of, you know, three horn uh, front line and that kind of thing. And it sounds great, they play the hell out of it. But if you've gone all the way to Cape Town, you want to hear what only they can play, and you get that too. And I think that's how the role of jazz has evolved since the early kind of concept of cultural exchange where you had <clears throat> the Russians saying, we'll send you the Bolshoi. Oh, yeah, well, we'll send you Dave Brubeck. It's uh, gone from that to being something that's so inclusive. It's so inclusive that it's not actually homogenous. Mm -hmm. there, there's something inherent, as you say, the bones of the form are there, how you go about it. The instrumentation, okay, you can add some funny percussion or some double reed horns or something, but you know the instrumentation is pretty much a constant. The uh, etiquette, you might say, you know, applauding solos, you know, performers on stage, pretty much universal. And uh, when John mentioned the underground scene, yeah, that's certainly something um, I experienced with my parents, and I experienced it in a different way in South Africa, where there was a lot of racial mixing that was uh, supposedly um, at least frowned on. It was technically illegal. Uh, there were there, you know, there were problems about that. But what jazz did in those diff for different kinds of oppression, but jazz had the same kind of social effect, which was to create some safe spaces. Mm -hmm. And I don't think authorities were necessarily ignorant that those spaces existed, but somehow they were respected because, uh, you know, dialogue somehow has to be part of a society. You know, there, there, there has to be some interface between people of uh, opposing views and factions, and, and, and jazz also provides that because it isn't just one kind of music, it's, uh, you know, it's a kind of wider concept. And the last thing I will say, again, carrying on from John, uh, <clears throat> if we go back to when uh, you were coming up, now your, your example of Malouf, I haven't heard his, his music, but um, a story that I heard from uh, Chucho Valdez, who uh, came from Cuba, and he was thrilled to meet Dave. They, uh, in those days, Cubans couldn't go to the States, but they uh, met in Canada, mm -hmm. and they got together around a piano backstage somewhere, and Dave was knocked out with his virtuosity. And this is be a, about six months before Era Carey. And uh, Chucho could play the hell out of the Duke or in your own sweet way or some, you know, that kind of repertoire. And Dave said, well, we'll play one of your things, which he did. And Dave said, do that. <laughs> you want to come over here with a band, you know, just bring the, <laughs> the greatest Cuban band you can get together, which, you know, I think it consisted of uh, Arturo Sandoval. <laughs> the other guy who plays high notes, John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, there, there were some, 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 yeah, and Paquito de Rivera. And so, you know, again, that shows kind of the breadth of jazz. Um, the late Hugh Masakela was, was a personal friend, and he told me a similar story about when he came to study at Juilliard, and he wanted to work hard, and he wanted to be able to play as good as Miles, and he finally met Miles, and he wanted some advice, and Miles said, play your thing, <laughs> don't try to play mine, you'll never be as good as me <laughs> at playing my thing, play your thing. And of course, you know, his, uh, Hugh's legacy is valuable and I think John has something to do with curating it or there's a scholarship. 
at the Manhattan School of Music, there were uh, Hugh Masekela scholars. Mm. And um, a month ago, last month, we did a concert at Dizzy's, music of Hugh Masekela, and we did a concert at Manhattan School of Music of Hugh Masekela's music that was orchestrated for big band. It's really mm. not easy, but it was great. Sean Jones played oh, one, yeah. I played one, and yeah. had a lot of fun with it. And yet, um, these kinds of exchanges that something like the, the program in the 50s and early 60s fostered were also cut off mm -hmm. by the United States, right? I mean, especially Southern segregationist legislators were like, well, no, we're not, we're done with this. We're not gonna spend money on this kind of thing. So I think um, it comes back to that idea of control, right? The governments can't control what what is, you know, they can control a lot of it, but but what is actually happening between these people. I wanna make sure we maybe have a room for a couple of questions from the audience. Um, if you do have a question for any of our panelists, if you can come down to the mics here um, and ask it that way. Oh, good. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Ashley, we knew you were sitting there with yeah. one. Yeah. Um, this is sort of a question, but I'm not sure you guys are going to know the answer to it. But the whole ambassador. Oh, it's a test. Really. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this, this will be on the final. Um, the, the, I mean, everyone loves origin stories. And the origin of you know, the whole tradition of the State Department tours goes back to the 50s during the Dwight Eisenhower administration, a Republican you know, administration that decided to make use of jazz. And I've always wondered about, uh, you know, where the inspiration came from, because Eisenhower was not a known jazz fan, you know? And there's the very famous 1953 Lionel Hampton tour that his wife Gladys put together in Europe that went on for about four and a half months covered so much of Western Europe and Northern Africa. And it created this incredible, you know, um, uh, interaction with, uh, um, you know, musicians over there. And Quincy was on that, Quincy Jones was on that tour, Clifford Brown, Art Farmer, Monk Montgomery. Uh, it was huge. And of course, it's kind of legendary that Lionel had this connection with Richard Nixon and was involved with his uh, you know, campaigns in Southern California in Orange County before he became vice president. And I've always wondered, is there something there where the Lionel Richard Nixon uh, you know, connection might have led to you know, this idea of European tours and then into other parts of the world? That 1953 tour was amazing. And uh, there should be a whole book just on that, you know, and I've always wondered if that was right. kind of the right. seed for what would later, you know, become the Dizzy and the... And Adam Clayton Powell is in that mix for... Right, the, the exactly, Dizzy. you know. I was just going to say Adam Clayton Powell, yeah. right? Hazel yeah. Scott. Yeah, Adam Clayton Powell is really where, where it traces back to. And um, Louis Armstrong did... Uh, you know, the famous tour of Africa, which was not State Department sponsored, but Adam Clayton Powell tracked that very carefully, and he, he was in uh, Congress, and he was advising um, uh, John Foster D Dulles, was the uh, Secretary of State at the time, not a known jazz fan. <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes you think, gosh, oh, for the old CIA, uh, they, they uh, you know, and, and for literate Republicans, they weren't uh, those, that bad. those were the days, <laughs> you know. Uh, so th there's Adam Clayton Powell, John Foster Dulles. Eisenhower doesn't get uh, much mention in this scenario. I think he was sort of too far back. But I'll tell you something about Eisenhower. Uh, when he was the uh, head of the whole U.S. Army operating in, in, in Europe. In those days, uh, the Army was segregated. That had been the, the way the regiments and battalions had been formed. And so that was the organization that he inherited. But he did as much as 
was practical to do to undermine that. Um, and when um, Australia wanted a uh, contingent of American troops to come to defend against the uh, Japanese, in those days, uh, Australia's official declared completely unvarnished uh, policy was Australia uh, just sent white troops. And uh, Eisenhower cabled back no troops then, you know, three-word three, three word telegram. And um, my father formed a racially integrated band within the U.S. Army. That's an oft-told story, too, so I won't go deeply into it. But he was in, in Patton's Army and, and picked up um, actually lightly wounded casualties from the front, anyone who could... Uh, carry an instrument and uh, and play it well enough. And <clears throat> somewhere way up at the top of the structure, there wasn't the kind of belligerent, no, you can't do that, or or even do that, but we don't want to know about it. It was it, it was okay. So I think getting back to Adam Clayton Powell, when he had some kind of power or at least influence um, in Congress. And Louis Armstrong's trip to uh, Ghana and famous stories coming out of that, um, he advised that this would be an appropriate response because it would show the best of what America has to offer. Great. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks it. for that. <laughs> Music historians in Eastern Europe have told me that uh, before the fall of the Soviet Union, the fire for jazz and the desire for freedom went hand in hand. The fire was very hot for both. Now that uh, the, the Berlin Wall fell and uh, Russia, Soviet Union has split up, uh, they're saying, I've heard them say that the fire for jazz is not as hot as it used to be. I'm wondering what you all's experience has been about that. Well, Lauren, you were just, well, I was there in October. These, were there more these kids were singing and swinging and playing, and they were, some of them were as young as 11 years old. Um, many of them were in their, like, 16, 17 years old, and they had studied the greats, and they were emulating them and trying to actually integrate what they learned into their playing. So. I would say there, it's, it's still the fire burns. <laughs> That's my opinion. I think it burns because of the students that I see coming over to study. Yeah. They're coming from all over, and they're playing their instruments, and they're playing this music very well. So it may not be... I mean, you know, we had Duke, we had Benny Goodman did a, did a State Department tour, Dave Brubeck. Right now, you know, it, at Carnegie Hall, I worked with George Wayne, and he would always complain, we don't have anybody can sell out the house like Duke or Benny Goodman or Dave Brubeck anymore. It's different. It's, it's just different. Um, the music that these young students are playing. I mean, I have young female piano players. I say, OK, I want you to learn this solo by Art Tatum. They don't even know who Art Tatum is when I give them the solo. I say, learn this. You can do this. Because they have the technique from classical. Two months later, you wouldn't, you, you, you wouldn't believe it. OK, we did our damn. Now let's work on the blues. You know, let's work on uh, After Hours by Avery Parrish. And it, you won't believe it. They really take it seriously, and they do the work. You know, earlier, with Charles McPherson and Terry Lynn Carrington, and they were talking about Charlie Parker and his genius. His genius came out of practicing 12, 13, 14 hours a day, and that's what these young kids are doing. I can't keep up with them. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I think we're at time. That says zero at the top. Um, thank you all so much, John, Lauren, Darius. Uh, this is going to be a great year thank commemorating you. Dave Brubeck. Thank, thank you all for coming. And don't forget that uh, 
Lauren, as, as our moderator, has a very musical last name. <laughs> On key. <laughs> okay, and if I, if I may be permitted a little coda piece, uh, which I wrote down, is uh, Louis Armstrong uh, said, remember, I'm just the courier. It's not me, it's the music. And I think this is maybe the only time, the only utterance that I'm aware of that Louis made with which I disagree. I think it was him. But now, two generations, three generations on, it is the music. It's uh, permeated, uh, you know, his, his message came through. And we've talked about personalities, people who had impact wherever they went. But, you know, as John and Lauren are pointing out, now it is the music, and that's the insurance policy for the future. It's, it's the music. It's not just about someone who can sell out Carnegie Hall or a stadium. Uh, the, the music is here to stay because it's growing and changing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. The Rockies may crumble. <laughs>